from a narrative on issue of energy. Um, the 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 phrase that is with us for since uh, the 1970s is the idea of energy transition. So what I'm doing is a historical analysis and a reflection on this notion of uh, of energy transition in history. What is striking is that the energy transition in face of the current climate crisis is, has become the dominant narrative. It is the future of reasonable people. It is the future of cooperation. It is the future of uh, consulting agencies. It is the future of governments, and it's also the future of experts. Um, when you look at the last IPCC report, uh, the group three of the report, it's a big, large PDF of 2,900 pages. The word transition is all over the place. You've got several thousands occurrences of the word transition. Um, when you look at the scenarios that they have integrated in their uh, models, they have received more than 3,000 scenarios, and they say explicitly, we have not included any scenario including degrowth, because none were proposed. So it's really a huge uh, blind spot, I think, in all this expertise. They don't really think about the reduction of consumption. It's really not in their, in their, in their frame mind. Um, if you look at the number of occurrences of sufficiency, it's only a few, well, a little bit more than 100 or 188. And actually, it is the first time that the word sufficiency appears in an IPCC report, in the group three of the IPCC report. Uh, perhaps you don't know that, but in the IPCC, there are three groups. The first group is about the science, the physics, the climate. So they've got physical models and they've got uh, measurements. The second group is about the impact. And the third group is about models. It is tasked with economists. Uh, economists, experts, so a bit of sociologists, uh, but really economists are, are, are dominating. And as you can see, the word degrowth is virtually absent. Actually, the, the few occurrences that appear are in the footnotes, in the references, not in the, in the main text. So the, the word uh, energy transition, well, you can use it as a future, as a normative statement. We have to do an energy transition. But the problem is very quickly when you look at how it is used, you see that this future is anchored in a kind of history. And you can find these kind of sentences in the, in the report. Uh, energy transition can occur faster than in the past, or we need to have a faster energy transition than what we had in the past. And here there is a problem because there has never been an energy transition. I guess you all know that, right? I mean, you know that we have never consumed as much coal, we never consumed as much oil as nowadays. Um, do you know what is the share of the nuclear energy in the global energy mix? Any idea? 5%, right. And wood? Nine. Very good. So you have some uh, good uh, students. Very impressive. I don't even have to, to make this presentation. Yes, wood is double of nuclear energy, right? After seven, 70 years of entering the nuclear age, wood is providing more energy on a global scale than, uh, than, than nuclear energy. Wood is not only the energy of poor countries. Wood has expanded tremendously in rich countries. Uh, for one particular reason, perhaps I will come back to that later, but the paper industry, starting from the 1950s and more and more in the 1970s, started to reuse what they call the black liquors, which is an enormous source of energy. Like in, in uh, Europe, it has more than tripled the wood energy since the 1960s. So it's really, we're talking about big numbers, right? Uh, wood is by far the main renewable energy in Europe. It's two thirds is wood. It's much more than, re than all the renewables, all the other renewables, even more than, than atomic energy. So really this idea of energy transition does not uh, very uh, quickly, you see that it does not work very well in the past. The problem is historians have, have really uh, fed this idea of energy transition. When you look at the main books in the history of energy, the big, like the large frescoes, the large, uh, uh, the large uh, uh, sagas of history of energy, they are framed in a series of transition. Basically, you've got the first chapter that deal with wood, with water, with wind. Then you've got uh, a group of chapter on coal. And then you've got the last chapter on oil, electricity, and all the other things, right? So you've got really a very transi transitional narrative, a narrative based on this idea of transition. If, if, you, if, you, if you want, and if you know of any of this book, and you'd like to discuss about that, we can talk about the historiography, if you wish, uh, in, in the end.
what I'm going to tell you about energy, the fact that the, the history of energy is fundamentally history of accumulation is true for all the other materials. I think that's uh, perhaps one important point. I mean, it's not true just for energy. It's true for all the other raw materials. It's very difficult to find raw materials that uh, have seen their consumption decreasing at a global level. Um, if you take the 50 most important raw materials, no, sorry, the 60 most important raw materials, there are just five which have diminished between 1950 and 2010. Most of them is because there is an interdiction, a ban. Acetose has decreased in the 1990s because it has been inter prohibited in certain countries. The only material that has decreased because of kind of obsolescence is uh, wool, sheep wool, but has been replaced with uh, artificial uh, textiles, uh, artificial fibers such as nylon, uh, which is not a very good news for the environment. So really the history of humanity is a history of accumulation. The history of, I mean, it's its relationship with materials. It's really a history of, of, of accumulation. Raw materials have never really become obsolete. And that's really the, the, the point that I wanted to make clear. If you, this is a, I mean, a series of graphs which are produced by the um, Vienna School, which studies quite rigorously, I mean, very rigorously, uh, this, this notion of um, flow of materials, material flow analysis. I mean, what is striking is what they describe is a constant accumulation. The, the, the extraction of materials has been multiplied by 10 between 1900 and 2000, from more or less 10 gigaton to 100 gigaton, basically. So if you take like the, the main narrative on history of uh, the Industrial Revolution, you got a history of transition from organic economy to a mineral economy, from uh, wood to coal, from water power to coal and steam engine. This is really the dominant narrative. But in fact, and it is well known by uh, environmental historian, um, renewable energy energies increased during the Industrial Revolution and quite uh, substantially. If you take the case of France, the um, hydraulic energy has been multiplied by three between 1900 and uh, uh, between 1800 and 1900, between 1800 and 1900, uh, multiplied by three, and this is before the great expansion of hydroelectricity, and it's been multiplied by 10, 20, I mean, three expanding very, very fast in the 20th century. If you take uh, wind power, it is obvious that the 19th century is a great expansion of wind power because of navigation. The, 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 ah, qu'est-ce que je passe? Qu'est-ce que je passe? J'ai compris. Alors, relancer le partage. Si on va normalement, mais là, ça paraît pas. Je suis désolé. Allez, je l'ai, je l'ai, je l'ai. Je vais partager l'écran. Tac. Il est là. Hop. Okay, so uh, of course, navigation is powered by wind uh, during even in the late 19th century. Wind is still dominant uh, for, for, for the transportation of goods. It's not less so, it's not true for the, for the transportation of, 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 of persons, of passengers. Wind power is also stationary wind power. I mean, in, during the 19th century and late 19th century, there is a huge expansion of wind power in the US. And not only in the US, I mean, in many uh, countries actually, but it's quite remarkable in the US. At the end of the 19th century, you got 6 million windmills, 6 million wind turbines, which had a crucial historical role because they pumped water. Uh, and with this water, they, I mean, the US could irrigate the plain of the Midwest, uh, foster agriculture, uh, uh, pr uh, of course. Uh, uh, irrigation and, and for the cattle, it was absolutely crucial. So, I mean, this is really a major turning point in the history of agriculture. The opening of the big plains of the Midwest is really a deep tr transformation of the market of the grains, of the production of the agricultural production. It's probably more important if you wish than the, I mean, what is central in the narrative of the industrial revolution is the water, uh, the steam power, steam engine powering uh, textile looms in Britain in the 1830s. But I mean, I think this transformation is much bigger. It's much, much more important than the than the what is happening in Lancashire, in Manchester, in, in the nineteen in the eighteen thirties, right? It's a much bigger transformation, and it is powered with uh, renewable energy. And then there is, of course, the human muscle, which is virtually absent in the history of energy. Sometimes they assume it is stagnant in the nineteenth century, 
which is ridiculous. I mean, the population is expanding enormously during the 19th century in rich countries, especially in Britain. And you got more and more people working uh, manually with uh, you know, physical labor. So of course, uh, the human muscle is social in the history of, uh, of 19th century and 20th century. I mean, for several reasons, First of all, you have to take into account all the human muscle that goes into the extraction of coal, into the transformation of the relief for building uh, the, the train network, the canals, all this is made by hand, right? With pick and shovels. Uh, there is no machines before the, I mean, there are a few machines for the canal Suez for extraordinary engineering projects. But otherwise, there is no machine before, before the interwar period. And the real expansion is after Second World War. So you could say that before the 1945, we have massively transformed the, the, uh, the, the relief of the earth, especially in Britain and in an uh, industrialized country with uh, human muscle. Second, there is a, 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 an aspect which is important, is that perhaps the, 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 I mean, the energy input with human power uh, has increased, but what has increased even more is the energy service provided with human muscle. Because at the end of the 19th century, there, there is a, a, a proliferation of innovation inventions, which allow a much more efficient mobilization of the human muscle. If you think about ball bearing, if you think about all sorts of, you know, this kind of small uh, chariot, I don't know, uh, uh, cars or, uh, I mean, for instance, you can read in the technical books of the of the 1920s, uh, engineers explaining that one of the biggest transformations they've experienced in the recent time is a flat cemented floor with a rubber uh, wheel and a ball bearing. That, that really transformed completely uh, the handling of goods. Okay, And this is not based on fossil fuels or coal or anything like that. But when I say that, it's actually not true. I mean, in fact, it is based on coal and fossil fuels. And I think the key aspect is to stop thinking about sources of energy in competition, not either or. They work together. In all sorts of technologies and all sorts of historical periods, sources of energy are not really in competition. They are in symbiosis. I'm going to give you one important example. And I, I mean, this graph is really important. It is um, a graph taken from a book by Anthony Wrigley with a major British economic historian. He has written the classic text on energy and the industrial revolution. And when you read his book, it is clearly a history of transition. For instance, in this graph, which has been then uh, taken and commented by many other books in the history of energy, you can see the disappearance of firewood, right? This is the dark gray. The dark gray area is disappearing in the mid 19th century. There is no more firewood, no more Firewood in the energy mix of Britain in the in the 1860s, 1850s, 1860s, and then of course the, you've got the sudden increase of coal, uh, starting from the early 19th century. Coal is expanding massively. This graph, uh, I mean, is problematic because when you say that Britain does not use any uh, more firewood, it is true, but wood is still absolutely essential as a provider of energy. In the 1900s, Britain used 4.5 million cubic meters of timber in, the, in, the, in its coal mines. To extract coal, you need to support the roof of the galleries, right? And this uh, consumes a staggering amount of 4.5 million cubic meters. This seems abstract, but it is much more than what Britain was using in the mid 18th century just to provide its energy. In, in the mid 18th century, Britain was burning 3.5 million cubic meters of wood. Early, 19, early 20th century, Britain is using 4.5 million cubic meters of timber for the mines, right? So uh, just, to, just to, to produce coal, Britain used more wood than it did before, right? Um, and it is even worse than that um, because you need much, much larger area to grow timber than to grow firewood because the, the, the rotation, uh, of course, is much longer. You need to wait more uh, for the tree to grow to become proper timber. Actually, when you do the calculation, you reach the result that Britain is using five to six more times forest area in 1900 than it did in the middle of the 18th century. 
So when you've got historians explaining to you that you know the industrial revolution is an escape from the organic economy, this is just rubbish. Britain is completely dependent on forests in the 20th century. And, and actually they know that very well. I mean, if you look at what is happening during the First World War, one of the big worry of, uh, by, of, the, of, the, of the British is that they are cut off from their um, sources of timber coming from the Baltic Sea and from the southwest of France in the land forest. You've got a, a huge plantation which was created uh, during the, the Second Empire, which was uh, providing a lot of timber to the, to the British mines. Uh, so, I mean, of course, when you say, for instance, in, in the in history books, you can read that coal is a national resource. It's not true. Coal, coal in Britain is completely dependent on international commerce, on, of, on, on, on uh, intra-European commerce uh, in particular. I mean, the case of Britain is just one example. All industrial countries, yeah. No, uh, today, most of the, I mean, the coal is mainly extracted in uh, open pit mines. So of course you don't need. We're talking not, not only about history because of course there are still mines which are subterranean, but since uh, starting from the 1960s, there is a complete transformation in uh, underground mining and more and more you, you use uh, technology which use um, pneumatic props. Which are which it makes that the consumption of wood is decreasing massively. But still, you got the statistics actually. The, my answer is this graph. Uh, this is the consumption of timber by mines in different countries. So USSR is consuming in the mid 60s 25 million cubic meters of wood. This is much more than the whole production of Germany and France together of wood. I mean, it's really enormous amount of wood just to extract coal. Uh, and it's mainly the, the mine in Donbass in Ukraine, which is which are consuming a lot of wood, a lot of timber. And still in 1992, so we are talking really about recent history with the collapse of USSR, it was a disaster in the mines of Ukraine because they were not able to import the same quantity of wood that was coming from central Russia. Right? So they, they are really, you have to think coal with wood. You cannot think coal as a substitution to wood. It doesn't work like that. Right? And what I'm saying about mine, and I will go a bit faster, is also true for all sorts of large technological systems of the industrial revolution. If you, if you take railroads, railroads consume much more uh, wood than, uh, than, than iron. It's really based on, on wood. And the maintenance of railroads is a huge drain in wood, especially in the US where the network is especially uh, large. This idea of steam justice works very well for other sources of energy. Because it is true, and the remark uh, in the back was, was true. I mean, nowadays, coal is not depending so much on wood. This is true. So in a way, there has been a kind of, uh, the symbiosis has been broken, OK? But it's not true for coal and oil. Uh, coal and oil still works together. I mean, you cannot imagine one without the other. Because you need coal to extract oil, because you need steel. And steel is massively produced with coal, right? And you need a lot, lot, lot of steel actually to extract oil, and you need more, more and more steel to extract oil. The, the length of pipeline and gas, you say gasoducts? I don't know if it's a proper word, gasoducts. Gas pipeline, thanks. So we got the, the total um, mileage, kilo, I mean, it, it, there, are two, there are two million kilometers of pipeline and gas pipeline. Two thirds is actually gas pipeline because it is. Uh, not very easy to transport gas by boat, as we all know uh, now. So uh, it's really a, a huge, huge amount of, of steel, and the amount of steel for each ton of oil extracted is increasing because you have to go deeper. Uh, you've got uh, also the problem that the oil that we are extracting is more and more, uh, is, 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 so, I mean, the quality is decreasing, and there is more sulfur in the oil, and the sulfur is attacking the steel. All this enormous infrastructure made, made of tubes, is constantly uh, eaten little by little by the sulfur and other uh, corroded materials that is present in the oil. So there is more, more and more still going into the maintenance of the of the oil infrastructure. So really, of course, uh, oil is dependent on coal. And historically, it has been the case. I mean, it's very obvious if you look at the history of automobile. In the mid uh, 1930s, to to produce one car, you need seven tons of coal to produce the steel, to produce the electricity, to produce the glass. You need a lot of coal, right? And Ford was saying uh, the two pillars of 
my trade of the automobile industry is coal and iron. And he was not mentioning actually oil, strangely because it is true that a car in the 1930s consumed more coal than oil. There are calculations being made by engineers for each ton of oil burnt in Britain in the 1930s, you had 2.5 tons of coal of induced consumption of the infrastructure of oil and the, and the automobile. And also imagine all the transformation of roads. So you need a production of cement and cement is depending on coal. So I mean, the two are really, really uh, closely uh, related together. And that's why this is a famous picture of the Ford factory in Michigan. Of course, there is a huge stack of coal uh, in the middle. And if oil is in competition with coal in such a market, for instance, for navigation, I mean, a steam engine is so cumbersome compared to a diesel engine that very quickly the boats are shifting from a steam engine to diesel engine. That's true. But in general, uh, oil increase the, the efficiency of the distribution of coal. So thanks to oil, the price of coal actually decreased in the 1920s, 1930s. And with very, you know, like um, very simple innovation, but the jump truck is completely transforming the distribution of coal and makes uh, coal much cheaper in the 1930s. This uh, symbiosis also worked very well between uh, oil and, and, and wood. First, to produce oil until the 1930s, you needed a tremendous amount of wood, of timber. The derricks, they are like 30 tons infrastructure. They are heavy, they are very solid because they have to resist a lot of uh, mechanical forces. And there will be a bit less than a million derricks constructed between 1860 and 1930 in the US. So it's a really huge amount of, of food. Uh, the petroleum industry would look, I mean, would look like that till the late 1890s. This is a picture from 1895 probably. And you could see that the transportation of oil is made with barrels, wooden barrels. It is made on boats, wooden boats with sailing ships, right? Uh, it is only in the 1900s that you've got uh, steam tankers, which is really the second part of, uh, of the history of oil. And this is a kind of anecdote uh, that we saw in our technology like. Uh, the big age of the wooden barrel is the oil age, because uh, you need to produce a lot of barrels, wooden barrels, to transport oil. And the biggest wooden barrel manufacturer, manufacturer is uh, John D. Rockefeller. Of course, I mean, he's the biggest oil producer is also the largest uh, wooden barrel manufacturer. This is probably one of the, um, probably the largest wooden barrel uh, factory, which uh, was possessed by uh, John D. Rockefeller in the early 20th century. So you will tell me this is the past. Now oil does not depend on wood. It's true that oil does not depend on wood, but oil has never consumed as much wood as nowadays. Why? Because there is one particular company called Valourec, which is a French uh, company specialized in the production of steel tubes. In the 1990s, Valourec bought up a German competitor called Mannesmann. And Mannesmann in the 1960s had built a huge uh, steel mill in Brazil to sell steel tubes to uh, Petrobras, the local uh, Brazilian petroleum company, right? And at that point, because of, uh, of, uh, of the tariffs uh, imposed by Brazil on coal, it was cheaper to produce steel with charcoal. You know what charcoal is, all of you? You take wood and you, with pyrolysis, basically you, you burn it, but without air. So the what you mean is nearly pure uh, carbon. Um, so they, they have, they bought a huge tract of uh, the Amazonian forest. They bought 230,000 hectares of forest. And they replaced it little by little with this, with eucalyptus, high yield plantation. I mean, this eucalyptus plantation, they are really new and it's completely changing the economics of wood. To give you just a few pointers, the productivity of this kind of plantation is 80 cubic meters of food per year per hectare. It produced 80 cubic meters of food per year. The productivity of a forest, of a normal forest in the early 20th century in the Western country would be two 
cubic meters of wood per hectare. So it's a complete transformation. It has been multiplied by 40. And of course, it is linked to oil. I mean, because to have this kind of productivity, you need to put a lot of uh, nitrogen fertilizers using gas or oil as a, as a, as a raw material. And you also have very um, uh, intensely mechanical exploitation of, of timber, which is consuming a lot of uh, oil. Um, so my, my point is just this, um, this uh, company used more or less 6 million cubic meters of food each year to produce its uh, steel, which is then used to extract oil. And this is much more than the whole consumption of wood by the US uh, petroleum industry in the 1900s or, or, or in the 1920s. So even if wood is not, uh, even if oil is not really depending on, on wood anymore, it is nevertheless the case that oil is consuming much more wood than it did, than it did before. Um, I will skip for this because otherwise I will not have time. Another large transformation of the history of energy, which is not really in the, neither in the history of energy books, nor necessarily in the discussion, is um, the growing importance of food as a source of energy in poor countries. One of the really big transformation in the history of energy of the last 40, yeah, 40, 50 years maximum, is the fact that you've got large cities powered with wood. If you take Kinshasa, which has been recently studied by a group of uh, researchers, Kinshasa, 11 million inhabitants, the, the capital of the Congo, uh, RDC, RDC. Uh, 11 million inhabitants, 96% of the population use, use charcoal on a daily basis to cook, right? And this amounts to, uh, I mean, there is a, they, they burn char charcoal because charcoal is a urban technology. It is very easy to transport. It's much more convenient to be transported with truck than uh, natural wood, right? So uh, you have to imagine that Kinshasa is depending on a huge area of forest, on the forest of the, of the Congo Basin, on thousands of square kilometers of wood production. And this is really new. I mean, in, in, if you take historical precedent, a big city that was powered by charcoal would be Paris in the 1860s, 2 million inhabitants, it would use only 100,000 cubic meters of charcoal, whereas Kinshasa is 3 million cubic meters, 30 times more. So this is really new. I mean, the ability to transport so much energy with charcoal is, of course, linked with the trucks. So it is, of course, a synthesis of oil and wood, which has powered the massive expansion of cities in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, this, this is the case for Kinshasa. Lagos is also consuming a lot of charcoal. And Dar es Salaam is also a major uh, consumer of, of charcoal. And this is really a new, new event in the history of energy, a crucial event. Uh, I mean, for, for charcoal production, it has been multiplied by seven in, in three decades in Africa. So it's, it's really something important that has uh, been going on. And it is based on this symbiosis of the truck and the charcoal and the human labor, because it is, of course, extremely intensive in human labor to produce charcoal uh, with uh, artisanal methods. But it is true also for rich countries. It is what I was mentioning at the beginning about the paper industry. Uh, I mean, just to, I got, uh, I got this, this is US data. Okay, this is US data. Basically on the, the blue line is the industrial wood energy, the, the, the wood energy used by the industry in the US. As you can see, it has been multiplied by three between 1950 and 2000. And it's much more than the decrease, it is the green line of the use of wood energy by uh, domestic I mean, residential uh, wood energy. So in the US, there has been a huge expansion of wood energy just linked to the black figures that I mentioned at the beginning. The fact that the paper industry is reusing uh, something which was before thrown in the river, the black liquors, and there is a lot of energy in the, in the black liquors indeed. This is from a recent report of the Joint Research Committee of the European Union, which has, which has done a really good work in uh, tracking the wooden biomass at the European level. So you got in blue, it's all the renewables that we talk about in the media. In orange, it is wood, okay? So two thirds of renewable energy is actually wood in, in, in Europe. And in red, this is the uh, black liquor that I mentioned before. Black liquor is larger than solar energy in Europe. 
okay, or wind power. So yeah. Is this for domestic or industrial? This is all, everything. So in in the in the yellow, yes, you've got so the you got the wind turbines, you've got the solar panel that provide electricity to us. Yes. Okay, so as you can see, this history of energy transition is really very, very obvious. I would think that this is a drugs company. Yes, yeah. So, would you decide renewable energy? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Which is actually debatable for several reasons. First, it is damaging the environment, for, I mean, depending on what you do, but it could be very damaging for the environment. Second, sometimes the wood is produced in uh, intensive high yield plantation, which is very demanding in terms of fossil fuels, like the eucalyptus plantation that I mentioned before. And then, well, I talk about this example, this is Drax, uh, I mean, the, the lower left uh, right picture, it's Drax company. Drax is a electric plant in Britain near Leeds, which was burning coal in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and in 2000, the management decided to shift to biomass, but biomass is a euphemism for wood. And what uh, they are doing, they are cutting down uh, wood uh, in the US, in Canada, uh, then they transformed it into pallets, wood pallets, and then these wood pallets are, are shipped with diesel boats to Britain and it is burned. I mean, the amount of wood that goes into that is just incredible. The, the, depending on the year, you've got sometimes 15 million cubic meters of wood which are burnt in these plants. It is far, far more than all the production of food in Britain. It's bigger than the production of food by British forests. And just to make a bit more than 1% of the energy of Britain. So that's really a good example of the dead end of the idea of going back to biomass, to power things that were built on fossil fuels. It just doesn't work. I mean, the, the, the mass doesn't work at all, right? Um, OK. so. I mean, with this example, I mean, th this is quite crazy. It means that Britain, after two centuries of energy transitions, being the leader in coal and then the first country to exit coal, is actually using much more wood than it did any time in the past. I mean, five times more than in the 18th century, which is a strange result after two centuries of energy transition. So the second part of my, uh, my talk is how does it, I mean, how does it come that um, we keep talking about energy transition all the time, even in historical terms? Right. Where does it come from, this idea of energy transition? First of all, you have to see that it is quite a recent phenomenon. Um, I will go quickly because otherwise I will never finish. This is, for instance, the kind of futurology that was common in the 1960s, 1970s. As you can see, this is the a vision of the future of the energy mix of the US. This is 2,200. And the engineer who is a promoter of solar energy uh, in, in this case is not envisioning any kind of transition. I mean, everything is going to be larger than in the, than in the present. The future is a bigger present. And it's just really common, the common vision of energy for a long period of time. There was not really this idea that the issue of energy is something of very dynamic substitution, uh, series of substitution, dy dynamic systems in evolution. No, it was rather seen as something expanding and everything was going to expand. I mean, nuclear power was expanding, we will be expanding with coal, with oil, with solar, and, and so on and so forth. So that was really the standard vision. There is one group, yes. And is this idea that it's going to increase, or is it increase that it has less? Yes, of course. Yeah, no, it's not a, it's not like Devons. So Devons would be even more crazy. I mean, it would be like a, uh, complete, uh, of course, uh, exponential growth. Uh, but I mean, people did understand that it was more like a logistic growth uh, that would happen in the future, uh, that the growth would slow. At, at one point, the, the demand for energy will slow down. I mean, when everybody will have helicopters and uh, you can't imagine going to have a... Anyway, so there's one group of, uh, of um, intellectuals um, who, who have a different vision of the, of the future of energy. And they are the atomic scientists. And a small group of atomic scientists actually working at the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. And it is, they are working at the Metallurgical Laboratory of the Chicago University. Under, I mean, it is them with Enrico Fermi, they built the first atomic pile. And uh, more, most of the time, they're on the left, and they are horrified by what they have done. They feel tremendously guilty by what they have done. And um, they are against nuclear armament. They are against the bomb H, for instance. And they are explaining that the uh, US should disarm, of course, with USSR. Um, 
but this they explained that okay they've created this uh, hor horrific thing uh, that's a bit wrong but at the same time they have created the key for the future of humanity and it is civil nuclear energy and especially breeder reactors because and, and that's why there are mass fusions because if you got atomic energy an unlimited source of energy then you can solve uh, the the Malthusian trap. You can escape the Malthusian trap because, for instance, you can produce as much food as you want because you can desalinate water, the water of the ocean. You can mass produce fertilizer and you can grow uh, uh, grain on the arid zone of the planet. So they they really have this connection between atomic energy, food, demography. And uh, one of the promoters of this idea is Ariston Braun. Ariston Braun is one of the atomic scientists working at the Met Lab, Met Metallurgical Laboratory in Chicago during the Manhattan Project. He's a young chemist at that time. Uh, and in 1963, he writes in a, it's a, it's a book chapter in a book on um, population control demo, and demographic problems. He's a member of the Neo Malthusian Links in the US, and he's really important uh, in, this, in this respect. For the first time, you can read the great energy transition. And it's quite logical that it came from the nuclear scientists. I mean, an energy transition was, it was already a phrase existing in nuclear physics. It is when an electron is doing something around its nucleus, it's called an energy transition. So he's really recycling a kind of a trade vocabulary for nuclear physicists into the energy debate. And then he's inspired from a major transition that was being discussed massively at that time, which is, of course, the demographic transition. So it is really this two influence of neo malthusianism and atomic energy and atomic utopia that uh, that truly really create this idea of energy transition. Another key intellectual in the in this respect is Marion King Herbert. You probably have heard of him. He's the inventor of the peak oil theory. But it's not just oil; it's actually all fossil fuels. And in 1955, I mean, he's working for the Shell Corporation, uh, the, the Shell. Uh, petroleum company, but in 1955 is recruited by the Atomic Energy Commission, the US Atomic Energy Commission, uh, because it's a very important character in the, in the lobbying of the Atomic Energy Commission. When you, you read these papers of the peak oil, actually they are pleas for atomic energy. Uh, and this is a very famous graph of 1956, where he envisions the history of humanity on a 10,000 year uh, scale. And if you take uh, the history of humanity between minus 5,000 to plus 5,000, well, then fossil fuels, of course, look very narrow. It's not very important. But what is really important is, of course, if you reach, uh, if, you, if, you, if you manage to master nuclear energy, then you can reach its enormous and infinite energy plateau uh, provided with nuclear energy. And Marion King Herbert is, uh, is uh, testifying several times in, in front of the Senate, in front of the of the House of Representatives uh, in the Congress to explain that yes, you've got to finance uh, atomic the Atomic Energy Commission because this is really vital for the future of the US. And if you don't do that, basically there will be a collapse because there won't be any more fossil fuels in the near future. So he's really an important character. There is a report sent by the Atomic Energy Commission in 1955 to John Fitzgerald Kennedy. There are whole chapters written by uh, Mayan King Herbert. So uh, REIT is this small group of, uh, of intellectuals. When I say they are small, they are not very numerous. Well, they've got, of course, the, the, the lobby of the nuclear energy, but economists do not agree at all with this kind of vision. And they explain, I mean, you've got a report from the 1950s or 1960s explaining that nuclear energy is just a waste of money. I mean, it's really costing a lot of money. It will never be competitive compared to coal because, uh, well, there are development costs and there are plenty of good economic arguments, econometric arguments explaining that nuclear energy is not very interesting in economic terms. And uh, nuclear scientists, the kind of uh, I, I've, I've talked about, Basically, they, for them, they, they say they don't have an understand this point. The point is not for nuclear energy to be competitive right now. It is for nuclear energy to be there, available when there will be no more coal, which is a much more profound question, much more existential question. So, I mean, the, the point is this vision of transition comes from a very long-term vision, and it is the nuclear scientists that have this long-term vision. Right? So it is really in this small group. And another point, but I don't have the time to uh, really enter into that, what I found reading the, the early texts about the futurology of energy 
that they're already talking about climate change in 19, early 1950s. In 1953, you got uh, a report made by the, uh, by the Atomic Energy Commission explaining why we have to do atomic energy. First of all, exhaustion of fossil fuels, and second, climate change, 1953, right? So very early on, they are, they are studying the, the, the phenomenon for one simple reason is the atomic scientists, they have the tools to study climate change in a much better way because they have got um, uh, uh, isotope analysis. And they are, at that time, it's a mass spectrographer. They are very rare. They are made to, they are used to produce uh, enriched uranium, but they are also useful to measure isotopes. And, and so they can follow in a much more precise way the cycle of the carbon. I mean, it's, it's really atomic scientists that play a crucial role in the in the advancement of, of, of climate knowledge in the 1950s. <laughs> but also a very good argument for promoting nuclear energy. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, people talking about energy transition. It is quite limited in terms of population. What is happening is after 1973 and the oil shock, everybody is talking about energy transition. Really, the, the turning point is the first oil shock in the US. There is one phrase which explodes in the public sphere. It is the idea of energy crisis. Everybody is talking about energy crisis in the press, on the TV. And then the idea of energy transition comes uh, following the step of the energy crisis. The energy transition is the solution to the energy crisis. One of the key characters to really expand the audience of this idea of energy, energy transition, you all know him, this is Jimmy Carter. Uh, and the, on the 18th April 1977, he makes a speech in front of the television. It's a strange speech because it's, it's a history of energy speech. He talks about the history of energy. And he says, in the past, there have been two transitions, one from uh, wood to coal, the second from coal to oil, and now we have to do a third energy transition. Okay? But as you all know, now, uh, this history is wrong. It's not true. The US has, has not been this kind of... Has not. Uh, done this kind of transition before. So actually, it's commenting on this graph. And then at the end of my talk will be about this graph, actually. This graph is really a novel uh, graphic representation of the evolution of energy. Can you see where is the trick? It's very easy. I mean, it's an easy, yeah. It's related. It's related, exactly. So they start to map the share of wood, the share of coal, and of course, wood is not very important compared to the enormous amount of energy that there is in coal uh, in, in, in the 1950s, right? So there is a, this vision of uh, two beautiful transitions. But of course, when you look at things in absolute terms, much less clear, okay? So, I mean, this is really a novel uh, graphic uh, representation of energy, and it comes from this guy. This guy, and I was quite proud of finding where, where it comes from, and this is the 1977 US National Plan written by civil servant at the Department of Energy in the US, and they had plagiarized the work of uh, this uh, guy, who is a uh, atomic scientist, not so surprising actually, Cesare Marchetti, um, working at Euratom uh, at that time, and uh, he had been, um, sorry, he had just been recruited by the Yaza in 1975. The Yaza, I don't know if you've heard about the Yaza, it is a uh, international research group who is doing applied system analysis, and the acronym. It is based in, uh, based in Austria. It has the particularity of employing both people from the East and people from the West. And in Ado Yaza, they have an energy group, a group of people founded in 1972. Uh, it was devised as the answer to the Club of Rome report. Have you heard about the Club at the Meadows report? I guess you have. Yeah, oh, okay. So it was uh, really, they were really willing to use the same kind of methodology, scenarios, but to show that there are other outcomes than collapse. And they are doing that uh, with uh, scenario uh, modeling. Just, I mean, if you can see this graph, there is names of, of, of uh, models, MEDE, message. Just remember for the moment that they are still used today in the integrated assessment models of the group three of the IPCC. So what is happening at the Yaza in 1972 is the beginning of energy modeling being done then by group three of the IPCC. And it is the same person, the same people. The early uh, researchers of the Yaza will be the middle age researchers of the group three of the IPCC report in the 1990s, right? So they're really the same person. And at the Yaza, they are doing the same kind of uh, 
scenarios and simulation that the Meadows, uh, Meadows report, Meadows uh, report has, has been done, just to show that there were scenarios of smooth transition from fossil fuels to renewables and or nuclear energy. At the group, energy group, they were asked to write a report on the scenarios that would allow a transition, a smooth transition, this is really the term they employ, a smooth transition from fossil fuels to renewables and nuclear energy in 50 years. Strangely enough, that really resembles a lot to the question that is asked to the IPCC report. Now it's only 30 years, but at that time, there's a bit more time. It was 50 years. And there, there um, basically what the scenarios were showing was that we shouldn't do too much effort right now. Because, okay, oil is going to get more expensive, but we have a lot of coal. So for the short period, in short term, we're going to transform coal into oil. So that will solve the, the petroleum crisis problem. And then in 50 years time, there will be, of course, the nuclear breeder reactor, which will uh, mass produce energy in an unlimited way. So basically, and, 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 and I think what is quite important to know is there is one economist, young economist working at Yaza at that time, and this is William Nordhaus. You've heard of William Nordhaus, recent Nobel Prize in economics for his work on climate change, explaining that it was optimal to wait a little bit and he's really formalizing in terms of cost benefit analysis, the scenario, the strategy of the Yaza. Okay, so inside the Yaza, this guy has a kind of different vision, the contrarian. He's a, a staunch promoter of nuclear energy. And he's also a strong promoter of hydrogen because he has understood that for nuclear energy to become really important, it has to escape the narrow uh, electricity market, which is not so much of the energy mix electricity as you well. know. So they have to produce a liquid uh, fuel and it will be based on hydrogen. So his vision is to have huge nuclear plants built in the middle of oceans, which would produce hydrogen from the water of the oceans, and then it will be transported uh, by boats to all over the world. And I mean, so he has a kind of Dr. Folamour uh, approach to, to energy problems in a way. But what I like uh, with him is that he, he also starts to study how long it will take. And to do that, it is, instead of using scenarios and, and computers, he's using history. And he's, he's starting to collect a lot of historical data on the evolution of energy mix in different countries. And he proposed um, a kind of um, prediction because it's more than. Uh, perspective, it's more like a prediction. I mean, it's really uh, uh, predicting the future based on history and using is using a logistic curve. So what, what Ken is doing is, is mapping the share of uh, different sources of energy in time. And then in saying that this, uh, this energy, uh, primary sources of energy, they are su substituting one with each other according to a logistic curve. You all know the logistic curve, of course, the S-curve, which is mapping very well diffusion uh, phenomenon. And uh, he's convinced that he has really found the key for the future. I mean, it's really, it's incredible. You got fantastic text by him saying that, saying that really it's, uh, it's worked. It works so well that you, know, you can predict the future of the energy mix uh, very easily with this curve. With the um, got empirical data, it seems to fit quite well, actually. I mean, to be, to be honest, uh, it's quite impressive. The, the fit is very good. The problem is that if you concern the coal, according to him, to him, coal should be disappearing in 2020. Actually, if you continue the data, then it's flat. Coal has remained exactly flat. So it escaped the logistic curve and the law of the logistic substitution it didn't work at all. Okay, it's a failure. So he's very often criticized, especially by Vaca Smil, who is a historian of energy, saying that he failed, he was wrong, it is too deterministic. But what people don't say is that he was the most pessimistic guy in the 1970s, because at the Yaza, they would explain, yes, in 2050, there shouldn't be any more fossil fuels, obviously, okay? Uh, in 2000, so in 2000, 2000 or 2020, there won't be any more fossil fuels. 50 years later, there shouldn't be any more fossil fuels when they write this report in, 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 in 1982. And Cesare Macchetti doesn't believe that. And he thinks that gas will be a key energy in 2020. That's pretty right in this respect. And so the, I mean, the, the, the frightening thing is that the most uh, pessimistic guy in the 1970s was far too optimistic compared to what had happened, okay? Um, 
this idea of energy transition, actually there is one group of uh, actors that find that uh, very interesting. They are the oil lobby. And I will finish with this anecdote. In 1982, a famous US climatologist called Jim Hansen, you've probably heard of Jim Hansen, The Storm of My Grandchildren, he has written popular books on climate change. Uh, he's like one of the well-known climatologists who has sounded the alarm in the 1980s in the US. And in 1982, uh, Jim Hansen invited, um, invited uh, Edward David, who is the head of Exxon Research, to give a talk on climate change. And at that time, Edward David was not yet climatoskeptics. What I mean is, uh, in his conference, he starts saying, yes, yes, of course there is climate change. There's nothing new and nothing interesting. Uh, the interesting question is what will come first, the energy transition or the climate apocalypse in a way? And it is a very astute way of diffusing the alarm, of diffusing the problem, because climatologists, you know, for instance, uh, and, and actually, uh, it goes on saying that, of course, everyone knows that there is an ongoing energy transition. And that in the past, there were transition, and that the Yaza report has shown that there could be an energy transition in 50 years' time. And for climatologists, it was, uh, I mean, it was really rubbish what he was saying, because when he says that we all know that in the US there is an energy transition, it is just uh, false. And he knew that very well because he, Exxon was investing massively in coal mines at that time. Okay, so of course there was no, absolutely no energy transition at that time in the US. But the climatologists bought this argument. And very often in the text from the late 1970s, when they start to talk about the future of the of the of, of global warming, you've got um, you know this kind of chronology. Uh, in 2000, the climate change will be sensible. In 2020, it will have economic impact. And in 2070, it will be disastrous. But when you're in 1978, 2070, you know, it's far away. And they go on saying that, well, we all know that it takes 50 years to make an energy transition. And still now you see, you, you have this, this, you know, sometimes you, you heard really serious experts saying that, oh yes, it takes 50 years to change an energy system. Actually, we don't know how long it takes because we have never done any energy transition, okay? So, I mean, to really summarize my point is to say that uh, this idea of energy transition has I think has been a potent way of doing nothing and of, um, it's a soft uh, kind of climate denial. It's much more intelligent and much more subtle than just being climatoskeptics. Because saying there is no climate change at a certain moment, it doesn't, I mean, doesn't hold very, very well. So the, 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 the much broader and much more used uh, kind of uh, climate denial strategy is to say, yes, there is climate change, but we are doing an energy transition. And the problem is with energy transition is that it projects a non-existent, a non-existing history, a false history, onto a future which remains for, for a large part wishful thinking. Okay, thank you very much. I hope it was clear.